think also it was a very important uh, aspect uh, to all of this, and that, th that was that Stuart embraced a responsibility beyond those immediate uh, commitments uh, and relationships of his, uh, and that is to the broader community, because he made a very considerable contribution to the destigmatizing of the illness of AIDS. Hazel Hawke talking about her friend Stuart Challender and the conductor's decision to go public about his AIDS. I'm glad you could join us for this very special story about a man and his music. It's being simulcast incidentally on ABC FM radio, surely a first for a current affairs program. Conductors are notorious for their longevity. Thomas Beecham, Bernstein, Von Karajan, Stokowski, George Schulte are just some of the celebrated orchestra leaders who've held sway into their 70s and beyond. It's a simple fact that so emphatically underscores the tragedy of Stuart Challender. The chief conductor of the Sydney Symphony Orchestra is one of the few Australian musicians of genuine international stature. At the relatively tender age of 44, he seemed to have the music world at his feet. What his public didn't know was that for some years the conductor has been living with AIDS. But instead of treating his affliction as a death sentence, Stuart Challender has used it as a spur to his musical achievement. As David Maher reports, the conductor, although progressively weakened by his condition, plays on. I got ill. I got a bug or something. You know, I don't know. Bugs affect me pretty badly, and I was conducting away one night, and I thought, you know, why am I doing this? <laughs> why don't I go home? You never know how many performances you have left. And I decided that I would rather do the performances in Australia. It's, 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 it's um, everybody's really trying to do it, but it, it makes it too short now. Look, let, let, let's play the long. I'll wait for you. One and two. He's been extremely important to Australia at its point of musical development. Um, and I was uh, privileged to witness this on the tour that I did with uh, the Sydney Symphony Orchestra when Stuart was conducting in 1988. Yes, very happy with that. All right, second movement. He's to Australia a national treasure, there's no doubt. He's made a great input to music in Australia and, of course, most noticeably with the Sydney Symphony Orchestra, its international work and its outreach work. I mean, he's a giant, he's literally a giant, but he's also a giant as far as, as conducting is concerned. I think, personally, he's probably the greatest conductor that this country's produced since Charles McCarris. Different sort of men, different sorts of repertoire, but essentially the same sort of conductor you could take out of the Sydney Opera House and put almost in front of any orchestra in the world, and they would make it work. Palm, I don't He's said that he's got AIDS, he's made it abundantly clear, and I think as such, he's attracted public sympathy in, in an extraordinary measure. He chose to say that he had AIDS rather than have it said for him, and that was a tremendous decision. It was a great hurdle. In July this year, I was due to go off to America for three weeks and uh, conduct the Boston Symphony Orchestra the Los Angeles Philharmonic and at the Aspen Festival. And for the same reasons that I came back early for, from uh, the English National Opera, I decided to cancel it. Really, really play the phrasing that's there. So we do three bars and then... Sometimes I think I wasn't really born to be a public figure. All right, just what's there, yeah. But on the other hand, I do believe that I was sort of born to conduct. Music was all he wanted because his dad thought he'd make a footballer of him and took him to the football one Saturday 
And the first court, of course, he had to put Stuart on the bus. He wanted to come home. Uh, he went straight to the piano. <laughs> My grandmother was a very uh, avid singer, and uh, I used to get her to sing this occasionally because it was my first bit of opera. And uh, she uh, used to reluctantly do this while I accompanied her on the piano. I, don't, I can't remember that. Might have been, I used to love and sing one fine day a lot. I used to take him for walks in his pram and often it was late in the afternoon, a winter's afternoon and the moon would be shining and I'd be singing to him as, we, as I pushed the pram along and looking up at the moon and he'd always be looking to me like that, listening to me singing and I knew then that he was fond of music because he was only eight or nine months old. I suppose it's the one thing that really takes me out of myself. And uh, when it's all working. And uh, delivers me to a place that is wonderful to be at. everything. I would willingly die tomorrow if it had saved Stuart. He could have my blood if I could give it to him. My father took me to a concert I hesitate because it really puzzles me why he did it. I mean, it was right out of his world. Maybe he was trying to get closer to me or whatever, I don't know. But he took me to my first concert and a conductor called Tibor Paul conducted the Beethoven Pastoral Symphony. And, uh, I thought it was the most wonderful thing I'd ever heard. And I determined that that was what I wanted to be. And my father, of course, was a, in Tasmania, a champion footballer, who was, um, if I've got the story right, um, was very famous because he kicked the winning goal against Victoria in sort of 1941 or whatever. Um, and I think I was always a bit of a disappointment to him that I didn't, wasn't very good at it. But I mean, it's one of those classic stories of being in, so intimidated by your father's success that you know that you'll never live up to it. And so you just get actually worse than you might otherwise have been. My father worked very hard to drag himself out of his childhood, which was dominated by the Depression. And he was determined to better his lot, particularly for his children. And uh, I must say that through dint of a lot of hard work, he succeeded. Well, you might as well say I read him. You might as well say, because his mum and dad worked and, you know, and they were living with me. And was it you who introduced him to music? Oh, yes, David. <laughs> yes, I got the blame of it all. Yes, they blamed me for it. He was to be a professor of chemistry or something. <laughs> 
Well, I mean, I was ambitious, <laughs> very ambitious. And uh, I knew that the only sort of career that would satisfy the ambition at that stage was an international one. And uh, so I determined to go overseas and become a professional conductor. You see, all, all the experience that I had in Australia was amateur. I should explain that I've known Stuart Challender for years. We planned to do this story for Stuart to talk frankly about his life and music. We both knew it wasn't going to be easy, but it turned out to be a lot more difficult than either of us expected. Stuart did go away to Europe and spent most of the next 12 years conducting in Swiss opera houses. He was living then with the American soprano Marilyn Schauer. By the end of the 70s, he was being offered very exciting work in Europe but he'd reached a crisis in his life which threatened to wreck his career. I decided that uh, I wanted to come home, yes. Why was that? I felt that um, the contribution I could make at home was uh, greater than the one I could make in Europe. And uh, if I succeeded at home, in, uh, at home, then I could probably come back and succeed in Europe as well. But um, uh, also, you know, the, the ambition had somewhat subsided, so that, that wasn't really a factor. I don't think of you as somebody whose ambition has ever subsided. The um, ambition to get rich and famous. What had been replaced by? I'm not answering these questions. Sorry. That was a musical question. It's getting too close to an area that I'm not going to talk about. Stuart, what position had your career reached by the end of your time in Europe? Uh, well, it reached a bit of a doldrum, really. Um, but uh, I had taken steps to get out of that doldrum. It, was, it became quite clear to me that um, uh, being a suppressed homosexual was uh, having a very detrimental effect on my career. It was making me so afraid that I was unable to provide the leadership that is necessary if you're a conductor. So I did something about it, finally, after so many years. So many years of um, pretending. And what was the effect on your music? Well... <clears throat> Unbelievably positive, really. It completely... Well, when I say completely freed me, I mean, we've had the experience of the AIDS recently. It uh, may have finished the process off, I don't know. There's always more to become free of, isn't there? I mean, the reason they took up music was because it was the best thing I could do when I compared myself to other people. And, of course, I had this idea that I was a second-rate citizen. Because of your sexuality? Mm. How long had you known that? Oh, it took a long while to dawn. Mm. But I didn't do anything about it. I mean, I spent 16 years suppressing it. And eventually it just became a bit difficult to handle. I think the fact that Stuart was Australian, who chose to live in Australia and pursue a career from here, uh, was a great plus as far as the audiences for the Australian opera and the ones that we sub subsequently developed for him through the symphony. And I think the advantages, in fact, were 
for both him as his development as a musician. He wanted to pursue a career as a symphony orchestra conductor. Uh, he'd been working in opera for quite a long time. The orchestra certainly needed the attention that he was prepared to give it. And I think that it was a, how you say, a mutually beneficial association. I think that Stuart set out to put his mark on the orchestra from the time that he became our conductor. I think that he has brought to the orchestra a sense of direction and I think that the direction that the orchestra was going was always going to mature along with Stuart. The great excitement is to work together to produce something of great value to the people that are listening. And while we're working as one person, that's when the greatest result occurs. Of course, in order to get us into that uh, particular mode, you have to have a leader. And he exerts his influence over this disparate group of people in such a way that they produce, we hope, a marvelous result. He has made a very big difference to this orchestra. Well, <laughs> I've had an extraordinary relationship with Don. Um, he has been nothing but an inspiration and a support since I came in. And I always felt with Don that there was somebody I could go to and ask advice. Even sometimes advice about conducting. Um, without fear of him sort of turning around and saying, oh, you know, he doesn't really know what he's doing, does he? And I shall always be grateful for that, immensely grateful for that, because perhaps it was the beginning of the learning to trust people. Uh, I think he's, he's also, he's a bit of an enigma because he's a gentle person, but he's also quite a violent person. Uh, he'll give you, um, uh, let's say, in the final movement of this Brahms, uh, where uh, I've got these, these rolls that start on the second beat, end on the third beat, and they're very, very sort of violent. And he'll look up, look up at you, and then, uh, and you can see in his eyes that he wants it to go, you know, really be incredibly strong. Uh, and that's sort of the violence in his, in his character, which he suppresses, which only comes out when he's actually playing. Yes, well, he's right. <laughs> yeah. I had been asked to be part of a program early in 1983 to check immune systems. And the results came through that my immune system was A1 OK. Then later that year, I got a call from my doctor, who uh, dragged me into his surgery and told me that I was HIV positive. By then, of course, they were testing. I was a bit shocked because I had not given permission for the blood sample to be tested in this way. But it was done. And what was your response to the discovery? Well, I went into sort of sh shock for four years. <laughs> and uh, yes, I think shock's the best word. I found myself going into another closet. I think everybody's been trying very hard and 
um, and just feeling the things, trying to imagine the things that must be going through his head. And it's just um, mind-boggling to me to see him standing up there and conducting when he obviously feels terrible. I mean, you can see that he, he must feel very, very ill. Um, and it's just, a, it's just a tremendous lesson to all of us. I mean, courage, courage is the word that really comes to my mind first. His courage is just fantastic. Were you conscious all the time of the clock ticking? No, no, I was far too busy. I mean, it was, a, in some sense, in some sense, it's a bit of an escape. But I never denied it to myself. And then after a while, I started confessing it to friends. But uh, it wasn't always easy. Some friends were easier to confess to than others. Why do you use the word confess? Well, that's what I felt it was. I mean, it was a... But why did you feel it was that? Well, I... <clears throat> I'd always been a very private person, and I... I'd always found it very difficult to share my problems with other people, including, including uh, my closest friends. I learned the greatest lesson probably that uh, I've ever learned, and that is what friendship can be. And what has it been for you since then? Well, an extraordinary... satisfying emotional and spiritual experience. Do you wonder now, looking back, why you'd not been able to have such friendships before? Oh, I'm very well aware of why. Why? Because I wasn't prepared to trust people. But you've learned trust? Absolutely. I would never have been able to come out to the press without that sense of Trust. Why did you do that? Why, why had the time come when you wanted to do that? Well, there was a catalyst, of course, and that was that a certain Sunday paper, Melbourne Sunday paper, and one that has since folded, <laughs> uh, were threatening to uh, write an article about how AIDS was devastating the musical life of Sydney and they were going to name my name. So, in a sense, uh, I suppose it was fear. Because I thought, oh, well, what will happen, you know? I mean, if they name my name, uh, and I got some very good legal advice and I was told that there was nothing I could do about it. I said, I mean, there's going to be, you know, every reporter in Sydney on my doorstep and it's going to sort of trickle out like a, like a drip, you know, like a blood transfusion and it's going to go on forever and blah, 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 blah. And I, and goodness knows how it was going to be handled, whether it was going to be handled sensitively or whether it was going to be and less sensitively than I would like. And uh, I finally decided that nobody was going to treat me like this. So um, I decided to get them all together and hold a sort of press conference. Um, it was also necessary to, uh, I felt, to contact every single member of the orchestra 
before it hit the press so that they would be informed. Well, I received the letter at the same time as everybody else in the orchestra. It wasn't really a shock because I already knew that he had AIDS. Um, but it was a big shock to see it finally printed on a piece of paper. And the way that it was written was very moving. And uh, I just, I felt very sad, very sad. And I just wanted to sit down straight away and write a letter back to him. I was really, really shocked. Um, we'd known in the orchestra that he wasn't well. Uh, it was just, uh, when the letter arrived, it was just uh, a real sort of confirmation. And I was also worried that his condition might have deteriorated so much. Uh, uh, but I was pleased when I found out that he was uh, he was okay and that he was coming back and that he was going to continue with this concert series with us. Um, so my, my feelings uh, are one of sadness, but also it's a positive thing because the music uh, is beyond us all. We're just uh, vehicles for the music. When I was made uh, chief conductor of the Sydney Symphony Orchestra, nobody had any idea about the illness. I mean, except me, of course. <laughs> and uh, I saw it as an opportunity to uh, develop as a musician, uh, almost like, you know, an opportunity that other people don't have. I mean, I didn't know how long I would have. Um, in those days, there weren't any life-prolonging drugs. Um, but I thought to myself, you, this is the opportunity that you always wanted. I mean, it sounds very much like one could become terribly bitter, you know. But I wasn't bitter, I was just grateful. And I've remained grateful ever since that this gift was given. Mm, I suppose since the 1988 tour, when he began to get ill, um, there's every, the fact that every performance has gone on has had a little more att uh, tension attached to it than would normally have been the case, and certainly normally the case before, than before 1988. Um, last year, I think, when, when some of the best performances were given, he did experience uh, you know, bouts of illness, which did affect, potentially, the performances going on or not. I, in fact, remember last year going out after the performance of the first work of a concert, the last concert that Stuart gave with us. And he was sitting at the back of the opera house here and he was very, very ill. And then the next day, which was a Sunday, I received word that we had to come to rehearsal again the next morning to rehearse the works that we'd in fact already played on the concert because a new conductor was taking over. And I suspected something was seriously amiss with his health then. Yes, I, I gather it would be an option to sit very quietly in a chair with a blanket over your knees and just wait for whatever's going to happen to happen. But uh, it doesn't happen to be an interest of his. And frankly, I mean, without his uh, work, um, Stuart's life, I think, is, is not as full as others are, if you perhaps re uh, remove one item. I mean, I think that he's, he actually comes to life as a personality. Um, when he's working and in fact he can come in and start rehearsals and be completely uh, energised. A, re a really uh, massive accent of wow! Okay. A diminuendo. Do the woodwinds have that penciled in perhaps? We were very happy, oh, look, very happy to um, that he A wanted to keep conducting and uh, we made the decision that we would support that for as, lo as long as we could. Now you're very, <laughs> you're very excellent, Ron. <laughs>
Excellent. I've got to be careful with you because they're going to interview you for this show. <laughs> All right, let's do it again. Two, three. I think also there's a very important uh, aspect uh, to all of this, and that, th that was that Stuart embraced a responsibility beyond those immediate uh, commitments uh, and relationships of his, uh, and that is to the broader community, because he made a very considerable contribution to the destigmatizing of the illness of AIDS. We've seen that in earlier years it carried an awful stigma with it which made the agony of, of sufferers and their families so much greater. And that, I'm pleased to say, uh, is becoming much less and less the case. We're becoming much more civilised in our attitudes and it's partly information becoming available and partly the education and the just making known to people of how it is. So that was a very important contribution and I think uh, one that uh, we should very much appreciate as a community. I feared that I might be rejected by my public. No, well, that certainly it. has not happened. Absolutely not. And I also felt, you know, to give the ABC a plug, that, you know, that you're in a big family. It may not always be a happy one, I suppose, but it's a... They're going to look after you. There's enough examples of it. Oh, is he the one from the Boston Zoo? I mean, it's sort of a bit naive, perhaps, but that's the way I felt. He was a member of Jethro Tull. Uh, Stuart's a giant in the Australian music scene, and I'm pleased he made the decision that he wanted to bat on, and I think it's an inspiration uh, to everybody, and uh, certainly I'm, I'm pleased that we're in a position to support that decision. It is a balance on our part of being practical because the orchestra isn't a plaything. It isn't there to indulge someone's whims, whether they be their final whims or not. And Stuart is the first to recognise that. So it's, it's really, um, you know, a fine balance of the judgement of several people. Doesn't smell. OK, frogged. Some people talk about giving a performance for a member of the audience or the audience. I mean, I do see the audience as a, an animal, I suppose, and, and not a set of individuals. I mean, I try and perform for them all at once, rather than just one. Your signature's getting maniacal. <laughs> that will do. Stuart, have a great gig, Alice. That's the girl. That's Alice from the cafe of the Gates of Salvation. <laughs> Got your glasses, Mike? Yes. People talk to you occasionally. Thank you, yes. Mr. Evans, doesn't Your mind's not on them. No. Tempo? Yes, you've got to get the tempo right. Tempo is everything. He gives 101% all the time. Uh, particularly at the performance, you know, and that's where the whole thing sort of comes together for him because, and that's, like as a player, you can't resist that. You have to actually go with it. You, you, know, you just can't sort of sit back and he won't accept uh, anything like that. It's a total sort of commitment. Stuart, as a musician, will you know when the time has come to stop? I would hope so. And I would hope that uh, those that I trust will uh, let me know. When you turn your back on the audience, what do you think of them then? Oh, well, they just disappear, really. <laughs> you're now paying for going on? Well, I don't know. I 
don't consider it a price. I consider it a, a gift, I suppose. I suppose my fear would be that I would be ostracised by my public. Not so much my friends, because we'd all been through it together. And my mind just went berserk with imaginings of what might happen. And what did happen? I received an avalanche of mail, not one of which was negative. Does that make you feel differently about the world? Yes. Because it justifies my faith in it. I mean, sure, I had the fear that my faith would not be justified. But I really put it to the test. And it's very important to me to know that I can trust the world. Have you felt differently about yourself since then? I've never felt freer. Thank you.